and welcome to Tuesdays with lecture series sponsored by the Friends of the Georgetown Library. We're so glad you're joining with us today. Tuesdays with is a series that we have been sponsoring here with the Friends of the Library for about now four years. And it's based on, uh, the title is based on a wonderful bestseller that came out in 1997 called Tuesdays with Maury. It's a series, it's a book which, uh, as our series is, emphasizes the need for continual life learning all the way through life, not just during those formal educational years, but in fact, all through our lives. And we're excited to have this series here to be able to present wonderful speakers on important topics related to Georgetown, our community, its history, its geography, its nature, all kinds of wonderful things. My name is Bob Willie, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. And we are also uh, having with us today Truman Wynn and Heather Pelham, providing the technological support for us for these presentations, allowing us to be able to live stream and then to YouTube so you can watch uh, this special lecture today. Our Tuesdays with today is Tuesday with Paige Sawyer. We're really pleased to have Paige with us once again, a regular in our series, providing wonderful insights into our community, its history, and again, its nature. Tuesdays with Paige Sawyer. Paige is a seventh generation South Carolinian. Uh, checked with him as we were preparing for today, and this is his 49th year living in Georgetown. I, I'm very happy with seven years. 49 is wonderful. He is a experienced and active military veteran, a photographer by vocation, and a tour guide on land and sea by advocation and passion. And uh, we'll be perhaps talking about that a little bit later on. <clears throat> Community activist and a good friend. And I say that with both a small friend, a good personal friend, which uh, my wife and I have appreciated so very, very much, but also a friend with a capital F, a friend of the Georgetown Library. Today he is presenting <clears throat> wonderful Winyall Bay, beauty of our community, beautiful beauty of nature nearby. And I want to mention that if you are live streaming with us right now, uh, there are possibilities for you to be able to submit questions, and you can do that through Facebook, and we'll keep an eye out for that so that after Paige's presentation, we'll be able to share some questions with him. Paige, welcome. It is great to have you with us today, and we look forward to your lecture on wonderful Winyall Bay. Thank you, Bob. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for tuning in, and we appreciate your presence today. And I want to tell you about a little girl named Julie. She was in the third grade. She goes to class one day, and her teacher says, guess what we're going to talk about today? And nobody knows, and the teacher says, whales. And Julie raises her hand and says, hey, yay, yay. We studied about whales at, in Sunday school, and Jonah was swallowed by, by a whale. The teacher says, well, we're not going to talk about people. We're going to talk about whales. And Julie says, yes, ma'am, but jo Jonah was swallowed by a whale. And the teacher says, well, Julie, I hate to burst your bubble, but whales aren't physically able to swallow humans. Julie says, well, that's what it says in the Bible. When I, and when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah myself. The teacher looks down at Julie and says, well, what if Jonah went to hell? Little Julie stood up, put her hands on her hips, and said, well, you ask him. All right. <laughs> Whales aren't in Winyaw Bay, but I thought that was a good lead-in to Winyaw Bay. If you look at Winyaw Bay, this is Winyaw Bay. Now, to orient yourselves, this is the Atlantic Ocean on the coast of Georgetown County. This would be Pauley's Island up here. This is Highway 17 coming south, crossing over the Waccamaw River, crossing over the PD River, coming on into Georgetown, uh, crossing over the, Black, the PD and the Black River, coming on in, into Georgetown, crossing over the Sampit River, heading south, this would be the Georgetown Airport, and going on down, crossing the North and South Santee into Charleston County. Now, these four rivers flow into Winyaw Bay. The Atlantic Ocean on an incoming tide flows into Winyaw Bay. So you've got a huge basin of water here, 525,000 acres. 
Now, the four rivers that flow into Georgetown County, they go through the swamps and the woodlands of, I mean, that flow into Winyaw Bay, they go through the swamps and the woodlands of Georgetown County where, the, where you have trees, trees with sap, bark, and leaves that fall into the water. All right, when those drop into the water, it presents what we call a tannic acid, tanning, which colors the water brown. So that's why the rivers have brown water and when they enter into Winyaw Bay, when the tide is going out, it's taking all that fresh water out into the ocean. So a lot, of, a lot of the water is brown as it enters the ocean. Now, these rivers were the I-95s of Georgetown County back in the 17 and 1800s. Here on the south and north Santee, you can see the names of the rice plantations that uh, were located on those rivers. You can see the names of the rice plantations on Winyaw Bay on up to the city of Georgetown on the Sampit River, and then into up to the Black River, the PD River, and the Waccamaw River. Georgetown County at that time had over 150 rice plantations, and it was because of the waterways that made rice a very good cash crop for Georgetown planters. Let's back up. Here we are. All right, now Winyaw Bay, I told you, is 525,000 acres, and it's what's known as an estuary. An estuary is a body of water that collects salt water from the ocean and fresh water from the rivers. So it's a basin for fresh and salt water. It's called brackish water. Now, an estuary, Winyaw Bay is the third largest estuary on the East Coast. The first largest is the Chesapeake Bay. Second largest is the Pamplico Sound, and you're looking at the third largest right there, and like I told you earlier, it's 525,000 miles. Now, an estuary is also the birthplace and nursery for oysters, shrimp, and crabs. So if we did not have an estuary, we wouldn't be eating these fine meals at home or in our, or in our restaurant. Now, Winyaw Bay... The Atlantic blue crab is very prevalent in Winyaw Bay. You can see the blue crab here. Now, 80% of the blue crabs harvested in Winyaw Bay, guess where they end up? 80% of the crabs go up to the Chesapeake Bay area. And if you're in the Chesapeake Bay area eating what you think is a Maryland crab cake, it's a good bet that the crab meat may have come from right here in Winyaw Bay. Now, sometimes when you go out into Winyaw Bay, you see what we call a tide line or a foam line. Now, that is not pollution, as some people think. That is an act of nature. What you're seeing when the tide is going out, bringing out fresh water from those rivers out into Winyaw Bay, this tide line or foam line, foam line forms, and it's a very active, healthy ingredient to Winyaw Bay. Underneath the water that you can't see are microscopic plant and animal life called plankton. Now these plankton get stirred up when the tide is going out. They get stirred up when the wind is blowing. They get stirred up when boats go back and forth. Now the plankton, that's what causes that tide line or the foam line. Plankton are very vital to the health of individuals such as you and I. Why? Well, if you look around when you're outside, you look around, you see trees all to the left, all to the right, behind you. Now the trees, they give off 50% of the oxygen that we breathe and need to sustain life. Where does that other 50% of the oxygen come from? Those plankton in your ocean. I mean in Winyaw Bay. Now if you head out towards the ocean on Winyaw Bay, on your right you're going to come across or come go past Battery White Confederate Fortification. Battery White was built in 1862 by the Confederates to look out into Winyaw Bay to see if there, were in, if there were any Union ships coming in to go up the rivers to raid the plantations. It had seven cannons and 53 soldiers stationed there, but actually there were no skirmishes or any other battles at Battery White. Today, Battery White is a protected fortification. It's on the National Historic Trust. There are two of the cannons still remaining on Battery White, plus the earthworks are still there. So if you're into old fortifications that protected Georgetown, you can make a trip out to Battery White 
and see it yourself. Now, Battery White did play a vital role during the war between the states. The USS Harvest Moon came into Georgetown in February 1865 to accept the surrender papers from the city of Georgetown. Admiral John Dahlgren, he was the skipper on that ship, and they came into Georgetown, they docked right behind the town clock, accepted the surrender papers from the city officials, and declared that all slaves throughout Georgetown County are now free. Well, it was too late for Admiral Dahlgren and the USS Harvest Moon to go back to Charleston, so they anchored right off of Battery White. And he said, we will get up tomorrow morning and head out and get back to Charleston by, day, um, by sunset. What he did not know, that there were several people, one who lived in the present-day Kaminsky house by the name of Thomas Daggett. He and a friend of his were building these mines, these Confederate keg mines. They would take a, they built them in the old Kaminsky hardware building, which is next door to the town clock on the second floor. Several nights prior to Dahlgren leaving Georgetown, at night on an outgoing tide, they floated these mines out to Winyah Bay and placed them randomly in the harbor. Admiral Dahlgren didn't know anything about these. Now he gets up the next morning at 7.30, says let's go to Charleston. They pull anchor and they head south. Within five minutes, guess what the USS Harvest Moon hits? Now this is the flagship of the US Navy. The USS Harvest Moon, the newest ship in the Navy and the fastest ship in the Navy. They hit one of those mines and they were only in 15 feet of water. The upper deck was above the water line. The crew on the upper deck, they immediately went down below thinking a boiler had blown up. They went down below, they found unfortunately a fatality, the only fatality in the explosion. He was a steward and a big 10 by 12 foot hole in the starboard side with water gushing in. Well, they couldn't believe it. Here was the USS Harvest Moon, the flagship of the US Navy slowly, slowly, slowly sinking into the water and the pluff mud. Well, they did everything they could do for about two weeks trying to salvage that ship. Unfortunately, Admiral Dahlgren had to write the Secret Secretary of the Navy, Sir, I regret to inform you, but the USS Harvest Moon is sitting on the bottom of Winyah Bay as a result of a Confederate mine. It was sort of an embarrassment to the Union Navy because Dahlgren and the Harvest Moon had gone into Georgetown to accept the surrender, which Georgetown had surrendered, and then the ship was hit by a, or hit a mine and was sinking on Winyah Bay. Today you can still see the top of the smokestack of the USS Harvest Moon where it has laid for the past 156 years. Heading on, heading on oh, before you leave the Harvest Moon, if you don't want to go out to the Harvest Moon and actually see it, you can go into the South Carolina Maritime Museum right there on Front Street where our good friend Bob Willie happens to work on the weekends and you can see a scale model of the USS Harvest Moon, learn more about the history of the sinking of that ship and also why, you, why you're in there. There are other displays that will captivate and keep you interested. I thought I had it here, but they have the Fresnel lens that came, off, came out of the Georgetown Lighthouse that was used for over 150 years. Those and other maritime and nautical uh, displays, photographs, artifacts, it's a wonderful place to visit if you want to learn more about the maritime and nautical history of Georgetown County. Now making your way out into North Inlet, I mean, I'm sorry, North Island, out into Winyah Bay, you're going to see brown pelicans. Brown pelicans several years ago were on the endangered list. They're on the protected list now, and they are a marvelous bird. Look at it. You wouldn't think it could fly, but it is very aerodynamic. In fact, we call it the Winyah Bay Air Force. The pelicans are very skilled at flying just above the water level. However, they don't look for fish when they're flying that low. They're up 20, 30, 40 feet when they look for fish. And the brown pelican, there are seven species of pelicans throughout the world. The brown pelican is the only one that dives. Oh, here we've got a brown pelican trying to hide with the white pelicans. White pelicans come into Georgetown County usually during the winter months. 
And you can see, I guess he wanted to be one of them, but he's on the back row, so obviously not, not too well detected. The brown pelican is the only species, only one of the seven species that dives for his food. Now, when they see a fish 20 to 30 feet up, they spot it, they fold their wings back, they put their head forward, and they dive head first into the water. You've got to be quick to watch them, though, because when they dive, they will turn their head to their left and go into the water. The reason they turn their head to the left when they dive, their trachea and esophagus are both on the left side of their neck, so when they dive, they're protecting those two organs. If they catch a fish or if they, he's got a big um, pouch underneath his lower beak, it fills with water. It's larger than his stomach. It can hold two and a half to three gallons of water. And they dive. Their beak is open to catch that fish. If they catch that fish, they come up to the surface of the water. They sit on the water. They have little valves in their pouch that allows the water to be released. He positions that fish head first, throws his head back, and down its gullet into its stomach. So that's a brown pelican. All right, you'll also see some uh, double-crested cormorants. Now, the cormorants are very interesting birds also. They can swim underwater just as fast, fast as they can fly above the water. And, over, and these are cormorants are throughout the world also. The Chinese have domesticated this bird and have taught it to fish for them. And you can see the long neck on these birds. The Chinese will take a ring, either a rawhide ring or a metal ring, and put it around his neck to constrict what it can swallow. And what the bird will do, it will dive down into the water catch a fish that's too big for it to eat or to swallow with that ring around his neck. So the Chinese fisherman then gives the bird smaller fish that he can swallow one after another. And after a few tries, that, fit, that cormorant catches on and says, hey, I can catch that big fish, I can't eat it, but I can sure eat five or six small ones so I can fill up just as fast and not have to work as hard by eating those small fish instead of that big one. And you can see here, the rings on their necks. Also, the comorant, I failed to tell you, I'm going to back up one slide. The comorant does not have the water repellency glands that some of the other shorebirds do, so they will get up on a range marker or up on a piling or something and sit with their wings out so the sun can dry their feathers. All right, let's go forward. Dolphin. Anybody like dolphins? They are amazing animals, and we see these in Winyah Bay quite a bit. They do their own thing. They come up when they want to, not when we want them to, but dolphins are very intelligent mammals. They breathe air just like you and I. Now, they can stay underwater between 7 and 15 minutes before they have to go back up and catch their breath. But dolphins, you know, if they're mammals like we are, we slept in a bed last night, you know, mighty good, had that cover up around our neck. We breathed in and out. But if a dolphin's underwater and they're a mammal and they can only stay underwater between 7 and 15 minutes, how do they breathe and sleep at the same time? Well, dolphins, the good Lord, when he created dolphins, he said, well, we've got a problem, but I'm going to solve it. When a dolphin goes to sleep, one half of its brain goes to sleep and one eye closes. The other half of the brain is awake and this eye is open looking around for predators. So after about four, five, six, seven minutes, this half of the brain wakes up, this eye opens, this half of the brain goes to sleep, this eye closes, and the dolphin goes up, gets some water, and repeats the process, through, I mean gets some air, and repeats the process throughout the night. So that's how dolphins sleep underwater and breathe air above the water. Dolphins and humans also have live birth. Now you women out there, you know when you gave birth to your son or daughter, the first thing they did to that baby was to pop it on its behind to get it to start breathing. All right, well dolphins, 
they have live birth also, but the birth is underwater. So how does that baby dolphin start breathing if it's underwater? Well, with a human, the baby, the head comes out first, then it's arms, shoulders, torso, legs. A dolphin underwater, here again in God's wisdom, he created that dolphin where the tail comes out first, then the body, then the head, and the mother moves it up to the surface of the water so it can start breathing. So amazing animals, baby dolphins will stay with their mother for about three years before they become mature enough and go out on their own. Oysters. Anybody like to eat oysters? Oh yeah! Oysters are good. You know, we're coming into the warmer season, so we won't be eating oysters too much longer, but oysters are very vital to Winyah Bay, and it's oysters that have kept Winyah Bay the pristine estuary that it is. Why an oyster? You know, when you look at an oyster, it's muddy. It's in the pluff mud. You have to wash them off before you eat them. But why are they so vital to the cleanliness of Winyah Bay? Well, an adult oyster, they filter the water. That's how they get their food. They filter the water for plankton and small animals in the water. So they filter the food when they eat. And here is on, the, on your left is a container of water with no oysters. Here on your right is a container of water with oysters. And look how much cleaner the water is after they've filtered it while they were feeding. Now an adult oyster can filter up to 25 gallons of water per day. So that's why Winyah Bay is one of the better kept estuaries on the East Coast. Alligators. Anybody like gators? You can see them on Winyah Bay. We saw one last week. Usually when you come up to a gator from the boat, when you come up to a gator, they will immediately go into the water. This gator stayed right on the side of the bank, didn't move. We turned the boat around, came back around, the gator stayed on the bank, and then the gator came, stayed on the bank, but turned its body around towards the, towards the boat and just stayed there and watched us. Pretty soon, the gator went out into the water and went underwater. What we're thinking, it was a female mother gator, and she had some babies on shore, and she was protecting those babies. Otherwise, the gator scoot out of your sight before you know it. Ospreys. We see a lot of ospreys on Winyah Bay. Ospreys are sometimes called a fish hawk. They will dive down, grab a fish in their talons, flap their wings, and go up to a tree or a nest and eat that fish. Now, ospreys only eat live fish or whatever they catch. Bald eagles will eat something that's already dead. But an osprey is a very good hunter, and the osprey is also a very unique hunter. They have talons. Most talons on birds are two forward and two in the back. The osprey has three forward and one in the back. And when they swoop down and grab a fish, they can, with that back talon, they can turn that fish around so its head will be flying in the same direction that the osprey will be flying in. The only animal you know, that can do that, turn that fish around so it's flying in the same direction as, the, as he's going. There's your bald eagle. Now the bald eagles, in 1967, South Carolina had 14, that they knew of, 14 pairs of nesting bald eagles. Six pairs of those nesting eagles was on South Island, which is fronts Winyah Bay. Now here we are in 19, what no, 2021, some um, whatever 67 from 21 is, 53, 54 years later, South Carolina now, now has over 400 nesting pairs of bald eagles. So whatever they did has worked. And that bald eagle, you can see him looking directly at you. And you know, we old folks, we have to go to the ophthalmologist and have glasses have our eyes checked once or twice a year so we can see 2020. That bald eagle, he doesn't need glasses. And his eyesight is not 2020, it's about 20 slash 5. 
What we see clearly at 20 feet, that bald eagle can see clearly at 200 feet. Our peripheral vision, if we're looking straight, straight ahead, our peripheral vision is about 60, 75, 80 degrees. That bald eagle can look straight ahead. His peripheral vision is 340 degrees. He can see almost entirely around him. That eagle, his talons are so strong, if you hold up your fist and clench it as hard as you can, that eagle has 10 times the strength of an adult in each of his talons that we have in our hands. So it's a mighty, mighty powerful bird. And does anybody know why it was named the symbol or why it was chosen to be the symbol of our country? Well, we had just fought a war, a war with Britain, the American Revolutionary War, and we won. So we wanted a symbol that symbolized freedom. So the forefathers at that time, they chose the bald eagle because the bald eagle is only native to the continent of North America and cannot be found on the British Isles, thus the bald eagle. And you can see the white plumage on its head and its tail. That's an adult bald eagle. They don't get that white plumage until they're between five and seven years old. And it's not bald. Bald, B-A-L-D, is an old English word meaning white. So that's the bald eagle that we see on Winyah Bay. There are two right there on North Island. Ooh, lighthouses. You can see this graphic that has eight lighthouses. We only have two on the coast of South Carolina that are operational. The Georgetown Lighthouse at the very top is the oldest lighthouse in, in South Carolina in continuous operation. The two lighthouses that we do have that are operational are the Georgetown Lighthouse and the Charleston Lighthouse. These others are mo more or less decorative or the lights have been taken down and they do not aid sailors and navigators anymore. But the Georgetown Lighthouse was originally a wooden structure built in 1801. It was built of cypress. The bottom portion was painted white. It had steps going up one side to the lantern room. Every evening around dusk, a lighthouse keeper who lived in a little cabin next to the lighthouse, he would climb those stairs, go up and light that wick with whale's oil. Well, we had a big bad storm in 1806 and toppled that wooden structure. The federal government said we need another lighthouse on that same exact spot on North Island, but we need it hurricane proof. So they started building the present day lighthouse in 1810, not out of cypress wood, but out of brick and mortar. The bottom walls are five and one half feet thick and the top walls are two and one half feet thick. Going around the center are 120 solid granite steps that gives it even greater stability. The lighthouse is still in operation today, not too many things built in 1810, 1811 are still working today. It's a little different from what it was at that time. I mentioned whale's oil. They changed from whale's oil to hog oil or lard. Lard changed over to kerosene. Electricity in the late 1940s and the lighthouse keeper stayed on North Island operating the lighthouse until 1968. In 1968, the operation of the lighthouse was taken over by the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard operated the lighthouse until 1986, and just prior to their departure, they installed a solar panel. So now the lighthouse gets its, its power from the sun. It has a beacon on the very top that rotates twice every 15 seconds, and on a clear day, it can be seen up, or a clear night, it can be seen up to 15 miles out into the Atlantic Ocean. The lighthouse, during the war between the states, the Confederates occupied the property and they didn't use it as a lighthouse, they used it as a lookout. They could look out into the Atlantic Ocean to see if there were any Union ships coming into Winyaw Bay. They abandoned the property in 1862. The Union Army took over the property at that time. They also used it as a lookout and they also had, at the end of that war in 1865, they had close to 1,000 former slaves living on that property. Slaves that had escaped the plantations and they were finding refuge on that property until the war ended. The lighthouse was badly damaged during that war. It was repaired, built, rebuilt to the present height of 87 feet and it's still there today and tonight about 7.30, 8 o'clock, you'll see that beacon 
twice every 15 seconds. There's another photograph of the lighthouse. The lighthouse is operated by the U.S. Coast Guard, but it's owned on North Island, which is owned by Tom or the Yawkey Foundation. There's the Fresnel lens I thought I didn't have. That's the Fresnel lens that came out of the lighthouse that was used for over 100 years. It's also in the Maritime Museum, and it's a, it's a beautiful crafted piece of glassware. You'll be amazed at how well constructed it is and the performance that it gave to a single light, how it spread it out and spread it far. If you're going to North Island, which is right at the, it's a barrier island on the Atlantic Ocean, there's driftwood out there. It's a beautiful place. You can walk, you can pick up shells, you can just enjoy the beauty, just the natural beauty of North Island. Also, if you go between May and August, you're probably going to see loggerhead or green um, turtle tracks because between May and August, that's when the loggerheads come up to the high dunes, past the high water mark, and lay their eggs. Now, a female will lay close to 100 eggs. She'll dig a nest out with her, um, whatever, those flippers, deposit her eggs, cover the nest, and go back into the ocean. Now, the eggs will take anywhere between 60 and 90 days, depending on the temperature, before they hatch. Usually, they come up out of the dunes at night. That's why on Polly's Island and some of the other habited islands that they ask you not to be shining lights on the, towards the beach. But the baby turtles will come out of their nest, make their way back into the Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately, only about one in 90 will live to be an adult because they're small. They become part of the food chain, and that's why they're protected. If you have children and they need some <laughs> release time or you need some release time, Put them on a boat, take them to North Island, they get away from the PlayStation, they get away from the phones, they have a good time exploring nature, they can walk on the beach, they can look for shells, and see all sorts of different sites that they, don't, that they normally don't see, you know, back home. Ghost crab, or a gray crab. It's called a gray crab, but we call it a ghost crab because it moves real fast sideways, sort of like a ghost. They burrow into the sand, and when you walk along the beach, you will see different tunnels where they've made their home. When the tide is going out, it creates tidal pools, and in those tidal pools, you can see all sorts of wildlife, such as starfish, jellyfish, shells. This is a whelk shell. This is a whelk. That's a cockle. These are oysters. Another cockle. That looks like a clam. Uh, sea urchins, we find sea urchins on North Island. Sea urchins, starfish, and sand dollars all belong to the same family, and they all travel in colonies. So usually when we see a bunch of starfish, a few days later we'll see uh, sea urchins, a few days later we'll see sand dollars. But they go and come. Kids love to pick up shells. They think that's a $50 bill when they pick up a shell, whether it has a hole in it, whether it's the most beautiful shell they can find or whatever. They just love to find treasure. Here's a jellyfish that was in some of the tidal pools. Horseshoe crabs. We see these. Horseshoe crabs have been on earth longer than the dinosaurs. And that's a long time. Five to seven million years, I think. But horseshoe crabs are very interesting animals. You only see them on the shorelines on the eastern side of countries, North America and Asia. They're just on the eastern side and not on the western side. Why? We don't know. But horseshoe crabs are very valuable to our health. If any of you have had surgery, before you had surgery, you went to the doctor or the hospital, they drew blood from you, they checked your blood to make sure you didn't have a bacterial infection. How did they check that blood? Well, they checked it with the blood from a horseshoe crab. The horseshoe crab has blue blood because they have a copper-based blood system. We humans have red blood because we have a iron-based blood system. So by mixing our blood with the blood from a horseshoe crab, that can determine if our red blood has an infection. Even the surgeons, they will 
sanitize their scalpels and other surgery instruments with the blood from a horseshoe crab. Now, the blood from the horseshoe crab is drawn very much like when we donate a pint of blood to the American Red Cross. Depending on the size of the crab determines the amount of blood they can take from the crab. They release the crab after he's donated blood. They put him back in his environment and 90% of them live a productive life after donating a portion of their blood. Now something else interesting about the horseshoe crab is this bird, the red knot. Now this bird migrates 9,000 miles from the Arctic Circle to the south end of South America. One of its stopping points is North and South Island. Why? Because the horseshoe crab lays eggs on North and South Island and this red knot eats the eggs. And can you imagine this bird making this migration twice a year from the Arctic Circle all the way down to the tip end of South America? We see all sorts of tracks on North Island, hog tracks, wild hog tracks, deer tracks, cat tracks, mink tracks, crabs, all over the place. Here is a horseshoe, I mean not a horseshoe, but a hermit crab. If you've never watched a shell move, it's fascinating to watch it because it has a little hermit crab in it and it will move around and you can watch it and see the track. Driftwood is out on North Island, and like I say, either you go out there, you pick up a piece of driftwood, you can pick up shells, you can just walk and admire the beauty, just listen to the quiet, wonderful place to visit. This gentleman, he visited North Island back in 1777, Marquis de Lafayette. He came from France over to America to help us fight the British. He was going into Charleston, the British had... Um, blockaded the port of Charleston, so he came on up to North Island and visited a Frenchman there. He was a Huguenot, Ben UG. They spoke in French. They understood each other. Lafayette stayed the night. The next day they took him to Charleston, not by boat, but by trail, whatever they could get to Charleston. He was wined and dined in Charleston. He was then taken to Philadelphia where he met General George Washington. He was made a brevet general in the U.S. Army and he helped us win the United States, or helped us win the Revolutionary War over Great Britain. Lafayette is well remembered in these parts. This is a plaque given in his honor, and it's on the front of the town clock here in Georgetown. All right, this is North Island. This is the end of Winyah Bay right before it goes into the Atlantic Ocean. This is the North Jetty that was built by the federal government in the late 1800s. This is the South Jetty built by the same federal government in the late 1800s. What it does, they go out like two arms and they make the water smoother. This is the channel coming into Georgetown. Now you can see this, the tide is going out here. So you can see all this brown water that is going out into the ocean. Again, it's not pollution, but that is the tannic acid that's in the water caused from the freshwater, freshwater rivers going through the woods in Georgetown County. Now, how much of the world is covered with water? I thought you would know, 71%. Good, man, you are good. You, did you have a cheat sheet? We've got to watch you. 71% of the earth is covered with water. And we know more about what's in the ocean and how, no, I'm sorry, we know less about what's in the ocean and what's in the water than we do about the surface of the moon. We do know that God created the animals in the ocean and nine of every 10 animals on earth are in the ocean. Anybody remember the movie, The Graduate? Now, I see a few heads shaking. That's good. Do you remember Benjamin, when he graduated, what his father's best friend told him what business to get into? Plastics. Get into plastics, Benjamin. You'll make plenty of money. Well, as we all know, plastics are helpful to us, but at the same time, they're helpful in destroying our, our planet. Micro, microplastics found in eagles. Discovery has implications for humans next up on the food chain. 
toxic dis discards turning up in animals and people. Here you can see this picture, plastics block, block the sphincter of a pygmy, pygmy sperm whale found stranded in North Inlet in 2010. Plastics industry targets bag bands. Some of the clothes we wear, they have plastics in them. When we wash them, those little itty bitty pieces of plastic, they get into the washing machine, they're taken out you know, through our water lines and eventually end up in the ocean. Nearly one billion tons of plastic are manufactured around the world each year. The MacArthur Foundation estimates that as much as a third of it never even makes it to the trash can. Recycling only captures about 14%. The deadliest ocean trash, fishing gear, plastic bags and utensils, balloons, cigarette butts, and bottle caps. And you can find all of those in the ocean, in the water. I'm sure all of you have seen or maybe participated in a balloon release party where you're commemorating a special event, somebody's birthday, somebody's had a baby, anniversary, whatever, but you blow, fill up balloons with helium, you release them in the sky and they're gorgeous going up in that blue sky with the white clouds behind, everybody oohs and ahs and a real good feel good moment. But you know, eventually those balloons, that helium is going to dissipate and they're going to float back down to earth. Now you think about the dolphin that's in the water, the sea turtles in the water, and some of the other marine animals, 90% of what they eat is jellyfish. Now what does this look like floating on the surface of the water to that animal? Jellyfish. They eat it, it gets caught in their esophagus or their stomach, and they die a very slow and painful death. So even though we're doing something that makes us feel good. At the same time, we're doing something which is harming our animals. And once the animals go, you know what two-legged animal is next. And this is, you can see jellyfish here on your right and a plastic balloon on your left. So it's not very distinguishable, distinguishable to that um, dolphin or the um, sea turtle or any other marine animal. You can see some of the damage that's been to this turtle. He swallowed that balloon. The ribbon is still coming out of its mouth. This one had a ribbon uh, caught around its flipper. Some of the trash that's picked up on the beaches every day. One day I was out on North Island and picked up five balloons. That was one I found on North Island. Look at this poor turtle that has been, you know, disfigured because of this plastic drink container. Some of the trash we see, it's all floated up from the ocean. You know, it was a wise old Indian, Indian chief, who said, you know, we don't get this land from our ancestors. We inherit it from our children. Now, you need a boat to go out into Winyaw Bay. I don't have a boat, and I see some of y'all don't have a boat either, so how am I going to get into Winyaw Bay? Well, lucky for you, we have a company. I don't have a company. I work for a company, Captain Rod's Low Country Tours. We go out just about every day during the summer months. We start in March and run through November, and all you have to do is call and make a reservation. We would love to have you, and you will get to see some of the beauty and the charm of Winyaw Bay. I appreciate y'all being with us today. Sorry for the technical problems, but I think it's been a good program, and I appreciate your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Oh, you stay here just a moment if you yes, would. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you so much for joining us today and wonderful bringing together your vocation of photography. These are beautiful photographs and your avocation of being a tour guide, which you've done for us today, and also your heart, a heart for nature and a heart for this area, once well, again. I appreciate it, Bob. Well, thank you, Paige. Um, one question, and that mm -hmm. is uh, in regards to the tours that you were talking about. I mentioned that you were a tour guide on land and sea. Uh, on land, you're also doing tours here in the city of Georgetown. A little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, we started old Georgetown walking tours earlier this year. And I had done some tours, walking tours, through Ollie. I was teaching a photography class there and also giving some presentations on Winyaw Bay and the history of Georgetown County. 
and they ask if you would do a walking tour. So we would do two or three walking tours for Ollie students once a year. So we did that for about two years, and I said last year, I think I'm going to start my own, my own company. So this year we started Old Georgetown Walking Tours. In fact, we've got one in about 25 minutes. <laughs> it's going great, and something I think that is unique that we do, we have an album of photographs that show some of the historical structures, what they looked like 100 years ago. And as we walk past it, we talk about the history of the structure and show them a photograph of what it looked like mm. and what they're seeing today. So people are really interested in the history of Georgetown, in the architecture, in the charm. I mean, Georgetown is mm. beautiful. The history, the beauty, the charm. I mean, you, you just, just can't match it. So, hey. Anything we can share, I love to do it. And with the boat tours, um, just so people are clear, you're not able to stop at the lighthouse. No, sir. The lighthouse, last year prior to the epidemic, the lighthouse South Island, or Yawkey Wildlife Refuge, they were offering tours of the lighthouse. Mm. Four people at a time. You have to call and make reservations. But since the pandemic, they have cut that out. From what I understand, they're going to start again sometime in May. And that's through the Yawkey Foundation. Through the Yawkey yeah. Foundation. But the right. boat tours go out, and, and you do then spend some time out at North Island. Right. You we beach the, the boat, and passengers, they spend over an hour on North Island, usually an hour and 15 minutes, mm. either walking, picnicking, shelling, beachcombing, whatever they want Just to do. Just enjoying themselves. That's right. Yeah. You know, one good thing about getting on a boat and going out to North Island or on Winyah Bay your heart rate goes down, your <laughs> blood pressure drops, your tension levels just ease out. So it's good sea therapy. Very, very good. <laughs> Paige, thank you. Thank this you, is sir. This a wonderful thank presentation. You, Bob. Appreciate and, it. And want to thank you for your time with us. I want to thank also our tech people in helping us out. We had some complications at the beginning, which all worked out. The team was at work also during the presentation, as some of you have seen. Uh, but just a wonderful group of people who are helping us here for Heather and Truman. I say thank you once again thank for all, all that you've done. I want to mention also, as I said, that this is a series and uh, actually tying into something else that Paige just mentioned, photographs. Here at the Georgetown County Library, we have probably, not probably, we have a fantastic uh, collection of photographs, journals, other resources that have been collected through the years in what's called the digital Georgetown County Digital Library. And the person who is in charge of that, who coordinates all that work, is Julie Warren. And Julie is going to be our speaker next month. And the topic is going to be the uh, excuse me, history at your fingertips, the Georgetown County Digital Library. So I know you'll want to join us for our Tuesdays with in the month of May as we continue our series next month on the third Tuesday of the month and we'll be sending out word about that. I also want to mention um, we did something this past year looking for creative alternatives in this COVID world as you were just talking about with the lighthouse. Uh, the situation has always been that the Friends of the Georgetown Library have had twice a year book sales but because of COVID we're unable to do that. Last year for a creative alternative, what we did through the end of summer and the fall was to offer books for sale uh, uh, at the farmer's market, the Georgetown farmer's market. And now for the first time, I'm announcing that this will be the case this year once again, uh, starting on Saturday, May 1st. The Georgetown Farmers Market will begin there on Screven Street across from the old courthouse building in the parking lot. We encourage you to come for produce and other kinds of things, but also for books. The Georgetown Friends of the Library will be doing the book sale there once again on every Saturday from 8 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And we'll have different books every week. We'll have uh, fiction, hardback and paperback, but we'll be doing cookbooks, history books, biographies, local books of local interest, all kinds of books that will be available there at the farmer's market. And we hope you will join us at that time. Again, thank you, Paige. Wonderful thank you, sir. presentation. And blessings and continued success in both the walking tours and Thank the boat you, tours, encouraging all those who are watching to take advantage of those opportunities right. and Paige's expertise, heart, passion, excitement, and uh, skills. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you all.